Hello and welcome from Cointelegraph Research Terminal. I'll be your host, Michael Tabone, Senior Economist with Cointelegraph Research. Today's panel will be discussing the cryptoverse of 2022, it's kind of a year in review from venture capital investment perspective, as well as what may be on the horizon for 2023 and beyond. It's me at Belridi from Keychain Ventures. Quick fire question on a scale from one to 10, one being bearish, 10 being bullish, how would you rate your feelings on the market going into 2023? Yeah, I guess to um, to give you a number, I would say three. Um, I guess, you know, uh, 2023 will still be driven by micro trends, um, you know, rate, inflation, geopolitical situation, energy, uh, uh, all the same stuff that, uh, you know, um, we, we've seen at the end of 2022. More specifically, I guess about crypto, uh, we still have also some headwind from uh, and, and, and second waves from ripple effects coming from FTX and other situations we've seen at the end of 2022. Uh, Robert Young, the CEO of, of Animoca Brands, how would you rate the state of crypto? So I would say um, it depends on which side of the table you're on. Um, so I think if I put my investor hat on, then I'd say we're at a seven or an eight right now, because I think it's a fantastic time to be deploying capital. Um, but I think if you're in fundraising mode, then definitely, you know, there are a lot of headwinds and it's challenging because, you know, it's, it's a buyer's market at this point in time. Um, so you really have to be able to stand out. You have to have, you know, solid metrics and performance and really be able to demonstrate that you're going to be in it for the long haul and able to withstand a reasonable amount of market turbulence for the next year, year and a half. Cheyenne Astley, director of Aquify Studios, your number on the market sentiment. Yes, I would say a four. Um, I do agree like on a macro perspective, um, things are not really um, looking bullish yet, like well, when it comes to inflation, but I think there is lots of clarity that needs to be also um, taken into consideration when it comes to uh, regulatory um, framework for people to gain come back confidence, but um, at, at the same time, I think it's it's a great time when it comes to uh, focusing on uh, customer adoption or as end user adoption. Um, there is a couple of good trends right now that I'm seeing going forward, and that's kind of the bullish part. What which I'm seeing and uh, makes me um, more optimistic, at least on that side. Very, very interesting. If I averaged everybody out, we're like just below a five. So we're, we're a little bit on the bearish side. And I get that. I believe me. Uh, I love hearing these different takes. 2022 was a roller coaster ride for venture capital investment on the blockchain industry. In 2021, the entire year, we saw just over $30 billion. And in the first two quarters of 2022, we saw just under that $30 billion in capital inflows. The problem is since April, there's been just but a downward, downward trend the entire 2022 year. Um, so we're just over uh, $36 billion for the entire year last year. So the roller coaster, it seems, has just begun, you know, just been plunging down. Um, so I'd like to go to uh, Robert Young. In 2022, Animoca yep. was on a tear, buying, buying all different types of companies. Um, was one of the leading ones. Um, Eden Games, uh, Darewise, uh, uh, Darewise, Tiny Tap, uh, Grease Monkey Games, a host of others. It seems Animoca is all overall bullish on this market, specifically metaverse and gaming. And what is your take on the current state of these crypto sectors? So I think um, we remain very bullish. I mean, this is what we do. Obviously, we've been a game developer for, for 15 years. Um, and so... Uh, the acquisitions that you mentioned are all game studios. So that's actually just continuing to expand our traditional business. Um, however, we have been focused on Web3 games specifically for the last five years. And that's, that's all we do at this point in time. Um, I think we still feel very bullish. I think that one thing, though, that remains um, constant in the Web3 industry um, is the fact that it changes all the time if that makes sense. Um, so I think that one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we're, like always, we're constantly reevaluating what business models and approaches and product types and marketing approaches, et cetera, work best. Because I think that the market changes so quickly 
Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, I mean, it's just volatile that you need to keep innovating. You need to stay on top of trends. You need to understand your consumers um, and you need to be very agile. And that actually is not that different. I mean, that agility has been a necessary skill, I think, in this market for years um, and will continue to do to be that way, you know. One thousand percent. I'm I'm part of a, a couple of NFT communities that if I take a weekend off and don't show up for a conversation, they it's like, what happened? Did you die? Did, you know, did you know what happened? Like it's been two days. You know, um, <laughs> Smiat, uh, you're the founding partner of Keychain Ventures, an investment platform aiming to provide institutional investors exposure to the blockchain and Web three ecosystems through funds and co investment opportunities. Do the funds and institutions have an interest in metaverse and blockchain gaming? Yes, I think uh, definitely. I mean, in terms of like funds, obviously, um, they are more faster adopters and more, you know, more willing to to uh, test the edges. So we've seen a number of funds. I mean, Animoca definitely is a leader in this space in terms of like being an investor into this space. There have been other funds that have um, dedicated, you know, vehicles or strategies to to gaming on the institutional side or corporate side, obviously it takes a little bit longer to develop that momentum and conviction. But I think uh, despite what we've seen at the end of 2022, there have been still some you know, announcements. I think notably we've seen Disney, for instance, uh, come out with you know, a strategy to use Metaverse for uh, you know, their experiences with users and stuff like that. Um, you know, Nike have been, with Nightland, have been uh, as well at the forefront of that adoption. So, and I think that trend uh, definitely, uh, you know, is 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 continuing, and uh, and we will see more of that uh, uh, despite the the turbulence. Uh, Chayan Astley, can you walk us through the open bridge between Web two and Web three, which is Aquify? Yes. Well, you know what what we're focusing on is what I call building the service layer to enable those brands and corporate and the end user, like the artists as well, um, to enter the space. And so if, if, if you right now, if you look at the space, there is a whole range of um, interesting applications that are being built. But as an end user, if you're a brand or an artist using those, it's very complex to have a like, good grasp of understanding all, all the different chains or the different um, applications, smart contract environments. And given that everything is open source, it creates even more fragmentation because you can always have a better, more optimized version of, of something. And so what we're enabling is think about an environment where um, as an end user, you have access to a template where you can just click um, deploy that use case um, in a simple UI or just with some API, I think that you're familiar with, um, all that in an environment that is decentralized itself. So that's kind of in a nutshell uh, what we're building. And to come up, just maybe to continue based on about the space, um, what we're thinking about, like the brands right now, um, I think the next, at least the bull case for, for that space will be really driven by um, consumer front facing uh, application like if you can really completely abstract away all the complexity all the jargons around nft blockchain particularly but really think about user value like application people can use uh, without even maybe, maybe knowing that they are inter like, interacting with a blockchain or a protocol um that's really uh that's that's strong absolutely and you bring up a great point and thank you because it's a great transition into ravi so my question is what do you think could be the spark to bring traction more into the blockchain gaming uh, world into the Web3 gaming sector? Sure. I, I think th it's very simple. It, we just need to have more products. I mean, it, you know, when you think about um, how ecosystems, game ecosystems have grown, a lot of that is driven by people just having the right hardware and access to the platform of distribution, etc. And so if I look back at the last sort of generation of evolution of games, uh, which was mobile, um, you know, that took several years before there was enough of a critical mass of handsets and more importantly games in the app stores for people who had handsets to actually be interested that there was going to be fun stuff there to play um, so i think that you know the blockchain game space is still so nascent um, relative to the amount of time it takes to make a good game you know it even a mobile game takes six months, you know, to make a decent mobile game. But when you're talking about um, web console grade, PC grade, um, you know, it can take years. So in fairness, you know, to have an to have an availability of 
dozens or hundreds of games takes a long time to start building that ecosystem. So I think it's just a matter of time. We've seen, you know, in 2022, we started to see some of these titles coming out into the market. Um, and so I think that we can see that the quality um, and enjoyability and playability of games in Web3 is absolutely there. It's just that there aren't enough choices yet for people. Uh, Sumit, um, I know that you are working with firms it is an international endeavor as blockchain really has no borders. What are some of the hot spots for firms you work with? And do you see any trends or changes over the past few years? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, very dynamic environment. And, um, you know, I'll just uh, say that my answer uh, is not specific to metaverse companies uh, or gaming space, but like, in general, I mean, regulation remain a big, uh, a big concern, uh, and, and uh, all the projects and the firms are trying to uh, optimize and you know find a find a good jurisdiction where they could you know operate and run their business. Lately, more lately, um, you know, uh, jurisdictions like the UAE have proven to be, let's say, more crypto friendly, attracted exchanges in part in particular, and some other projects as well. To be based um, based um, in that jurisdiction, right? Regulation, regulation, regulation. It's the thing hanging over the head. And where does Aquify see itself in the short to medium term in 2023 and beyond as we as we move into the next year? Yeah, I think you know right now, given that we're in a bear market, um, for as as an early startup, I think our is what I think is important is to really focus on. Um, shorting the first of all this kind of sell cycle, but also thinking about what are what are actually the unique feature or small sets of feature where we can um, basically offer to the clients and really focus on that. So you know, as in, in a SaaS business, usually you may have a different range of, of of offering, and it's not only driven by market, but sometimes it's about creating new markets. Um, whereas here, given that we're in, we're, in a, we're in a bear market, what I think is very important is thinking about what the client really want in terms of maybe a unique feature that you can offer them and be the best at it in a way that nobody else can actually be comparable or you can provide a better service than yourself. So for us, it's really focusing on where we have really an edge, what we can really um, provide value to the client and become the best at it. Um, and, you know, um, cost, can, can cost down costs on that front. And later on, use that, let's say, just access that resource into expanding into new market. Awesome. Excellent. So, as we all know, crypto winter, they can, la can last for a long time, be very brutal. So, I just wanted to open it up to you guys. What makes you, right now, in the short, medium term, 2023, 2000, you know, what, what gives you the, that, the, the, the signs of the thaw or, or hope? Okay. Um, I, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'm actually I, not very pessimistic at all, to be honest. Um, and, and I think that that's partially due to the fact that I suppose we've, we've been in the space for quite a while. Um, I mean, as, as we like to say, if, if this is a crypto winter, then 2018 was an ice age. Um, so I think that it's all relative. Um, I think one of the things that for me is the most exciting thing about, you know, the kind of frenetic pace of the last two years is that, you know, Michael, you you quoted those investment statistics about funds coming into the sector um, over the last two years. And I think that those have been transformational in resulting in one key metric, which is the amount of talent that I've observed coming into the space, meaning people who made the decision that Web3 was now mature enough that they were going to leave a very good position at a very established business to say, I'm gonna do something different and I'm going to do something because I think a Web3 way of doing this is going to be more interesting than what I'm doing now. And, you know, the people voting with their careers is often a bigger decision than making a financial investment. Um, and so when you see that kind of exodus of talent um, moving into a space, I think that's the best validation you can get because that's what's going to drive innovation. A thousand percent. Yeah, I don't feel pessimistic either because... Uh, as you mentioned, the statistics I had mentioned before, the the lowest um, you know the lowest uh, income venture capital inflows that we saw 2022 were still higher than, than what we saw in 2020 and 2021. You know what I mean? So we're still it's still at a higher pace. It's just 
lower than it was the year before. But focus started to shift away from Web3, it seems, and back into DeFi. So DeFi was the king for a lot of VC investment for a very long period of time. And then it shifted to kind of Web3. And Web3 is Animoca's um, wheelhouse. That's in Web3 is GameFi and Metaverse and all that stuff. So it's only one data point. It's not a trend. But I'm very interested to see what happens in this next in this next quarter. Um, why do you think, you know, DeFi would start heating up again all of a sudden in the last quarter when we're in the bear market? Right. Why would that be? Why do you guys do you have any, any insights into why that might have might have might have happened? I mean, I can volunteer my view on those numbers. Um, I will not uh, say that DeFi has heated back up. I will just say, relatively speaking, Web3 compared to DeFi uh, have seen more uh, you know, reduction into investment or inflow of capital into Web3 compared to DeFi. But both of them, it, I think if we double click on the numbers, you will see that the trend is both trending down. I think also it's interesting to note that, you know, um... The Web3 community is much, and, and I use that as a general term for all things blockchain. Um, I think that it's become a much more diverse community with people now um, enjoying different silos of interest, whether you're more in the fintech side of things or you're more in the content side of things, etc. cetera. Um, and one thing that I think gives me a lot of, um, you know, encouragement is that if you look at over the last quarter there were a lot of new projects coming out um, you know tokenized projects on behalf of big consumer brands you know whether it's Starbucks or reddit or you name it and um, including Adidas and Nike and stuff and these projects continued on their roadmaps and continued to launch with consumers despite the fact that FTX blew up in the most spectacular way right in the middle of all of those projects. But for companies that are planning, you know, two-year product development cycles and marketing plans, they launch when the product is ready for customers. They don't care about what the market information is because that's not part of how they serve customers because their sort of USP is different, right? It's not related to the prices of crypto or things like that. So I think that we've seen effectively in 2022 kind of a decoupling between what I would call the content side of Web3 and Entertainment Web3, where we spend a lot of our time, um, and the financial services side of Web3. It used absolutely. to be the same. 2019, it was right. all the same. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today on the panel. It's been extremely interesting hearing the different takes from everybody. And from all of us at Cointelegraph Research, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for watching. We look forward to presenting you with another great panel really soon. Thank you. Buy Bitcoin. See you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>